All right. Uh, golly. Uh, you guys are keeners. Uh, it's nine o'clock in the morning. Um, and you got to understand who I am. You know, so this has been a great conference. Uh, uh, lots of incredibly smart people explaining incredibly useful things to you guys. I qualify as the light entertainment interlude. <laughs> so you can all go back to sleep now because I don't have anything of value to say. But uh, I do have a few stories. Uh, but before I tell my stories, because you guys actually are smart, it's, you know, I'm talking to students all the time, and the nice thing about talking to students is I can channel my mother. So, uh, uh, so I, I had obviously two parents. My father was a Harvard Business School educated guy who studied economics at Cambridge University. My mother never graduated high school. Her, her claim, academic claim to fame was she got, uh, in her German uh, language classes, she got zero in German composition and she got one in German literature. <laughs> and when, when the teacher asked her why she thought she got one in German literature, it turns out because she spelled her name correctly. <laughs> okay, so of my two parents, I took after my mother. So that's why I literally have nothing useful to tell you guys. Um, but my mother did have one astounding skill, and I give her complete credit for all of my success, and it is that she could tell a story as well as anyone you have ever heard. She could captivate a room and just because her stories were fascinating and they were fun. And she was completely unconstrained by the truth. Okay, so when we were kids, this is my two brothers and I, would interrupt mom all the time, say, mom, that's not true. Finally, my father had to intervene and say, boys, the people your mother are telling stories to want to hear the stories. They don't want to hear you interrupt. You can't do that. And we go, but dad, she's not telling the truth. So uh, we finally, we negotiated with my Harvard Business School uh, educated father. And we agreed that we could not interrupt my mother as long as her story was within uh, ten, uh, was within, uh, what does it work, uh, ten times of whatever the truth was. So if she said we had a hundred people over for dinner and we had eleven people for dinner, we were not allowed to interrupt. <laughs> if we only had nine people for dinner, we could interrupt. Okay, so I tell that story just to give you guys a sense of when you hear me say something, and, and Linus and, and um, Dirk and, uh, you know, they hear me tell my stories and they start rolling their eyes because they know they're not true. <laughs> well, there, there's, there's a nugget of truth in there somewhere. So I'll let you guys figure out what's true and what isn't. Okay. Um, but the other thing you got to remember is everything I say is seen through the same prism. Um, so where you guys actually like to get things right, and to a certain extent, and this is what I loved about Linux in the early days of Red Hat, is, is no one was really very nice to each other, but everyone was very respectful of the Intel microprocessor. Because the Intel microprocessor was the objective referee. And when you would contribute code, if the Intel processor liked your code, Linus would use it, and if it didn't like your code, Linus wouldn't use it, and Linus didn't care who you were. He cared whether the Intel microprocessor liked your code or not. And that's what you liked about it. It allowed this meritocracy to work. In the very early days of Red Hat, when I had no idea if this was going to make any money at all, I always had backup plans, and my backup plan was I would go into technical recruiting because I knew how smart all of you guys were, and I knew where to find you. And better yet, most of you wouldn't recognize a clean t-shirt if you saw one. <laughs> so you were all completely unemployable in terms of, of going through job interviews. But I'm a sales guy, I could have got you a job. Um, okay, so... Um, what I'm doing these days is, is uh, Red Hat went extremely well. Uh, so uh, we hired a team of guys who were much, much smarter than I was at building large companies. So 
I was the CEO of Red Hat 93 through 2000. Uh, but in 2000, we had just partnered with uh, Cygnus Solutions. We were suddenly a 400-person operation doing, I can't remember, 60 million bucks worth of business. And I had never worked for a company that big, much less managed one. Uh, but we were fortunate to have Matthew Zulik and a bunch of other really smart guys, so I got out of their way, and, and the rest is history. Uh, it, I keep running into Red Hat guys like, like Stephen here who, who keep coming up to me and going, Bob, you know, thank you for, for setting up this great company. And they've got it so backwards. I just started a little business. You guys at Red Hat have turned it into truly a great company. And, and I'm just so honored to be associated with you guys and proud of, of what the Red Hat team has accomplished. Um, uh, and I'm not going to speak about the future of Red Hat. Uh, the nice fellow I met at Bank of New Zealand, I made the mistake of what does he want to hear, and he said, what comes next? I go, whoa, that's way above my pay grade. Um, but what I do is, is I'm an entrepreneur. What, what gets me out of bed in the morning is looking for new business opportunities. And I thought I'd tell a couple of the early Red Hat stories to give you guys a sense of of just why what you guys are doing is important and why it's scalable and why you don't have to worry that it's going away anytime. But equally, why you need to find business guys to partner with if your particular innovation is going to scale, if, if you're going to uh, do well with it. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, I'll tell a couple of stories. The uh, first one relates to 91 through 93. I was still in the computer leasing business. I had sold my business to a, big, a bigger Canadian financial services company. Uh, very sadly, over those two years, uh, the parent company, the company I sold to, went backwards and, and uh, went out of business. And I found myself, I thought I was a wealthy guy in 91. By 93, I had taken my net worth back to something below what it was when I graduated university 15 years earlier. Only now I had three kids and a big mortgage. Uh, uh, but in 91 through 93, I was working in the computer leasing business. I was doing a newsletter to try and, and uh, make friends with you guys, or your equivalent in New York and Boston and Washington. Uh, and I would ask the, the guys at the user groups, what did they want to hear about in my newsletter? And they would say, well, tell us about open source. Well, not back then. They said, tell us about free software. You know, the Kermit dial-up modem, the X window system, you know, this, the uh, Cygnus uh, 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 tools. And I was, so that's what I would write about. And I would find people to write about in my little newsletter. Um, but yet, when I would think about this space, about where Linux was going, I was a bigger skeptic in 91 through 93 uh, than Bill Gates has ever been about open source and Linux. Because I'm a business guy. I'm, I'm an evil, cold-hearted capitalist. And, and I just don't, I did not believe that altruism was going to keep a sophisticated software engineering product going into the future. I didn't care how much the guys I ran into in this space in the Unix world loved free software and really believed in this collaborative of development. Uh, but instead of it going away from 91 to 93, and in 93 I was now unemployed working out of my way sewing closet selling some slackware in O'Reilly books on a thing called ACC Bookstore. Uh, we were, in fact, Amazon before, Am before the World Wide Web. We sold books. You, you send an email to acc-corp.com, sales at, and you got an ASCII catalog sent back to you. And then you printed off the last page of the catalog and you faxed in your order. Um, and we were selling Yggdrasil and Slackware and uh, uh, what others. Those were the two big ones, actually, at the time. Uh, but by 93, instead of this stuff going backwards, it kept getting better, as you guys know. Linus actually came out with a 1.0 version of this thing. And I'm going, this doesn't make any sense. So I did a tour of, um, of the smart guys. So I went up and visited Richard Stallman in, uh, in Boston. 
And I'll, I'll tell the story about the GPL in one second that Karen thinks is, is, a, is an interesting one. Um, uh, so I went up to Boston and Richard gave me the same story I was getting from most of these guys, which was, you know, open source or free software is from engineers according to their skill to engineers according to their need. I don't know how much Karl Marx you guys have written, but the Berlin Wall had just fallen. And uh, I just go, there's no future to this. I'm at the end of this little tour. I'm down in Washington talking to Don Becker. Uh, who was doing Ethernet drivers for Linux at the time. He takes me out to Goddard Space Flight Laboratory, shows me this really cool uh, supercomputer. 16 Intel processors in mini towers, stacked four across, four up, and literally wrapped together with duct tape. <laughs> All connected out the back of, of this thing with Ethernet uh, cables, one to the next. And he would, had just unplugged a $5 million Cray with this thing. And, it, you know, I was asking him, where is, you know, why was he giving away his software? You know, the Ethernet drivers that he was writing, because it's clearly sophisticated stuff. And he says, because it's the right thing to do, Bob. You know, it, it's, it, you know, th this, is, this is good. This is how engineers think. This is just altruism. I go, no, uh, uh, Don, who pays your salary? And, and why did they pay your salary and buy you $150,000 worth of Intel boxes and let you give away your software for free when they could have, if they put a proprietary license around, recouped at least some of that investment? Don't stop and go, that's a really good question. <laughs> so he says, you'll have to talk to my boss. I go, okay, next time I'm down. You know, uh, I'd love an introduction. He says, no, uh, Dr. Thomas Sterling uh, was... Um, he works stupid hours. This is Don's boss. He might still be here. This is now 10.30 at night at Goddard. So we meet Dr. Thomas Sterling in the empty cafeteria at Goddard, 10.30 at night, and I ask him this question. So Sterling says, okay, Bob, let me get this right. Uh, yeah, Don and, and his team are writing very sophisticated Ethernet software. Uh, and they're giving it away for free, so pick a number, 10,000 lines of very sophisticated code that these talented guys are writing. And yeah, if it was a, under a proprietary license, we might recoup some of it. But when, when we give it away, all I get, you know, all I get is, as a reward for giving it away, is a gigabyte worth of multi-user, multitasking operating system with complete source code and a license to do whatever I want with it. And you're taking advantage of me? And what he had just articulated was a barter system. Or uh, someone, it might have been Chris, was arguing, well, it's actually a gift economy system. I don't care. But it was an economic model that actually works. That by giving away something of value, you get something of greater value. And I go, I bet, uh, I was willing to bet my kids' college education once I understood there was an economic model to this. So I'm now committed to it, and I'm now looking for a product that would scale that, that when Linux got into CompUSA, oh, that's right, you guys are all Kiwis. Okay, <laughs> CompUSA was a retailer <laughs> in the early 90s in the States, computer retailer. Uh, anyways, the worry was once Linux got into CompUSA, I didn't want CompUSA to be my competitor, so I needed to brand a... a some sort of product that I could sell to CompUSA instead of competing with them. Uh, and that led directly to uh, Mark and I getting together. As a complete side note, by the way, uh, Mark Ewing and I refer to each other as co-founders of Red Hat. But the reality is, and we both admit this, the reality is we are in violent disagreement as to who actually founded Red Hat. Because I founded the company that became Red Hat. The legal entity, if you trace it back, was founded in my wife's sewing closet. But Mark started the project that was Red Hat Linux. And uh, so because we could never figure out who the founder was, we refer to each other as co-founders. All very much good nature, but an interesting sort of historic element. Okay, so the reason I was so excited or so interested and willing to bet my kids' college education on Red Hat and Linux, 
The thing that I was picking up from all of you guys, or again, your equivalents in North America, wasn't that uh, that uh, free software was better than proprietary software. When I would talk to um, the guys at Southwest Bell, who came to our little Linux Expo in 1994, I think it was, in Raleigh, North Carolina, and um, uh, I would ask them, why are you using Linux? You know, is it better, is it faster, is it cheaper? And they would say, no, we don't actually like Linux. It is neither better nor faster, nor is it more secure. You know, we really should be using Solaris or we should be using AIX. But what it does do for us is when we build systems because we have complete source code and the license to modify it, it gives us control over the systems we're building. And no one else will do that for us. And that's why we have to use Linux. And as a typewriter sales guy, uh, the, you learn as a sales guy, but one of the first lessons you learn is you don't sell features of your product. You sell the benefits of your product to your customer. And so I wasn't selling free software or source code or, or price. I was selling control over the technology. And it was recognizing that, that open source gave us a, a, a feature that we can sell to customers that all of our billion dollar competitors, and the interesting thing for, for Red Hat in the early days, is our competitors were not Sousa or Caldera. They were our friends. <laughs> we were trying to create users of this. Uh, our competitors were all multi-billion dollar proprietary software companies. It was IBM, it was Sun, it was uh, Apple, it was uh, Microsoft. And all of them were multi-billion dollar players and, and we're thinking we can make a living competing with those guys. And the reason we believed we could was because we could do something for you guys and your equivalents around the world that no one else could do or was willing to do or their economic model was aligned to be able to allow them to do, which was to give our customers control over the technology. And yep, that's if I made a contribution to, uh, to the success of Red Hat, it was simply recognizing that. And the single most rewarding thing I've done in the last month is before I came down here to talk to you guys, uh, I went into Red Hat for the first time in a long time. Uh, just to find out what their messaging was. <laughs> what it was they did not want me to say publicly. Because I didn't want to come and talk to you guys, have you guys record the damn thing and have the Red Hat stock price crash because <laughs> <laughs> the founder said something stupid along the lines of Lulu Lemons, uh, CEO, uh, chairman and founder who, who accused uh, uh, their, their customers of, of being the wrong size to wear Lululemon yoga pants or something, if you followed that story. <laughs> Okay, so, so we're not going near yoga pants. Okay, the single most rewarding thing about visiting uh, Red Hat and asking them what I shouldn't say is they're saying exactly the same stuff that we were saying in 1994. The value proposition that Red Hat sells today is identical to that value proposition. It is that they are treating their customers like partners in the use of the technology they're using. I go, whoa, this is, this is just really, uh, personally, uh, both in a business sense, but personally, it, it just really, it makes you happy to realize that business actually can work really well. I mean, I've always known it could work well. I've, I've been a businessman uh, since, well, I come from a long line of business guys. And so we know that business can be a very beneficial, in fact, primarily is free markets, uh, and the capitalist system really does work well to make our society uh, richer and wealthier. But every now and again, you see a, a project like the Red Hat Project and you just go, wow, you know, and we fixed a problem that the US Justice Department was struggling with. Uh, again, in the early 90s, when they were watching the big monopolies that, that Microsoft were accumulating. And this open source community solved that problem for the Justice Department such that 
all of the predictions in the early 90s about how the US Justice Department was going to break up Microsoft into its component parts went away. And it went away because of what this community on a global basis did from 91 through 96 or 7 when the Justice Department just completely dropped the investigation against Microsoft. It, it just hugely, uh, what, uh, satisfying in a personal sense. Um, okay, here's the interesting story that, that Karen was talking about, uh, and then I'm going to go to questions because I'm more interested in what you guys want to know than expounding, but uh, Karen was at a, a Sandler of the Software Freedom Conservancy. Software Freedom Conservancy. <laughs> if you haven't bookmarked the Software Freedom Conservancy, now's your chance. Okay. Uh, she was at a little talk I was giving in, in Raleigh, and someone asked the question of, uh, what do you think about the different free software licenses? And I came out with this rant in favor of the GPL over everything else. And Karen goes, hold on, I love the GPL, but why does this evil capitalist love the GPL? And here's the story, is when we were uh, uh, in the early days of Red Hat and we were looking at all the different licenses and there was a lot of debate. Okay, were, were the BSD licenses out in California more intelligent because they allowed you to use the, um, uh, the software without the author of the software surrendering as much control as, as he might with the GPL? Or, or the NPL, the Netscape Public License, that, that you know, tried to fix what the Netscape lawyers considered some of the flaws in the GPL, or uh, you guys can Google <laughs> free software licenses and you'll see just how fast the debate was and the range was. Well, I'm, a, I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> I'm a business guy. And a business guy, the biggest single challenge you have as a business guy is to get the world to pay attention to you. That's your biggest single challenge. So you've got to simplify your pitch and you've got to find things that resonate. And talking licenses, like talking about licenses in front of customers was the quickest way to get someone to go running back to Microsoft. Because they didn't want to have to think about clause 13 in the NPL license. They didn't want to have to understand why the, net, why the BSD license was better or worse than the GPL. And the beauty of the GPL license, and, and the guys at the Free Software Foundation deserve a lot of credit for the first 10 or 12 years of this, is they had defined the term free software around the GPL. So you didn't even have to read the GPL. The moment you said your software was under the GPL, everyone knew precisely what that meant or at least they believe they did, doesn't matter, it's the same thing for practical purposes. <laughs> I told you I'm not a lawyer, okay. I'm a sales guy, and sales guys don't worry about the details. This is where my mother's training about as long as what I tell you is within, has a 10% of, uh, of a nugget of truth in it, gives me complete permission to con you into using Red Hat rather than Susan. <laughs> But quite seriously, I, to this very day, I do not care uh, whether you use Red Hat or SUSE or, or uh, golly, I've been out of the Linux world so long I can't even uh, uh, come up with the names and it's really not Slackware and Yggdrasil anymore. <laughs> um, because the guys at SUSE are doing the right thing. If you are a SUSE loser uh, user, <laughs> That actually was a Freudian slip. I wish I was that clever. <laughs> By the way, can I take this home? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the value of the GPL, coming back to this, uh, is that it communicated what we were about. Uh, and 
and we were under pressure, our, our lawyers never understood where our commitment was. The industry, even the open source industry, never understood our commitment. And certainly Richard never understood my commitment to the GPL. Uh, Richard Stallman, when I would meet him at conferences, he understood we were doing the right things, but he was convinced we had an agenda. You know, once our market share was big enough, we were going to slap a, a proprietary Microsoft's license on something. And what he didn't understand was I'm a typewriter sales guy. And the value that open source gives my customers was control over the technology they're using. And that was the only benefit that I could offer that IBM and, and Apple and Microsoft were not prepared to do for my customers. And that's where our commitment to the GPL comes from. And if you're thinking about doing uh, open source projects, um, just don't waste your time trying to micromanage your license and build a better one. Because in the effort to build a better one, you lose the primary value. Your customers no, now have to read your license to understand how your license works vis-a-vis -vis their project. And the very act of having to read your license will stop them from doing business with you. The moment you just can use an existing license, and, and our preference is the GPL, everyone knows precisely what they can do with it. They relax, then they keep moving forward, and they're happy to do business with you because you simplify their lives. And that's a, a key element to all customer relationships. If you can make that customer's life simpler, he likes you a lot better than if you make his life more complicated. OK, so what do you guys want to know? Instead of what I want to know. Sure, go ahead. Or just speak up and I'll repeat your question. Right. So you mentioned being an evil capitalist, and I just want to know when, when you sort of, when, when you were managing Red Hat, when you sort of took a step back and go, wow, we really are changing the world. Okay, so as a, a, a you know how families go in, in trends, so you know, doctors tend to come from families who have had other doctors, and lawyers tend to you know, in a much higher percentage than the general population come from families that have other lawyers. You know, my father and my grandfather were entrepreneurial businessmen, so I think in terms of making the world a better place through building companies, because in our, our free market democracies, the consumer and the citizen are the same person. And you can frequently solve social problems in the marketplace, allowing the, our society to vote with their pocketbook on the product or the service that they consider most aligned with what they need to make their world a better place. Okay, um, having said that, uh, particularly businesses, once they earn a monopoly position, can abuse uh, their market power. And, that's, and so as a result, I'm a big fan of, of government regulation done properly, which is a big issue. But I think of, of regulation as simply being like the referee on a football field. Without a referee, you literally can't play football. And I don't care what kind of football you're talking about. Without a referee, you can't play. Because the guy who cheats the most will win. And then the whole thing collapses because everyone cheats and there are no rules. So you have to have referees in the space because the capitalists, guys like me, we, we are innovators. We're looking for ways to change the market to the benefit of our shareholders at the expense of someone else's shareholders. Not the Sousa guys, because I love their shareholders. <laughs> um, uh, so, so it's sort of a joke I make, but it, it's a joke that it's acknowledging a reality, that, that there are businesses that do really well making the world a worse place. You know, pick your favorite, uh, you know, the naked people uh, businesses, uh, alcohol or tobacco businesses, as a good example. They are serving a desire of our society, but they're not serving a need, and they're definitely not making the world a better place, but they are making a lot of money doing it. So, uh, sir, next question. Um, it seems to me that it, it's certainly something that we or in, the, in this room agree that 
control over the software and being able to use it and learn from it and uh, verify it and continue it is an, a, a great benefit not only to us but to the people that we you know that we deploy this software for and so forth but it, it sometimes seems to me that the customers of uh, large Linux companies and uh, you know, even people using Android phones say um, aren't interested in the control that that might give them. They're interested in the fact that someone else has looked at it or that it's free or that sort of thing. Do you, how do you think we can communicate better? And what do you, th what do you see the sort of the features of control that are actually going to mean something to those people in the future? It, uh, golly, no, it, it's a, a great topic. And I would uh, encourage each and every one of you to reach out to each and every open source aficionado you know around the planet to make sure that you guys understand you have a role to play in the healthy functioning of our society. Uh, because our politicians uh, who aren't necessarily bad guys. I've met many of them. They're, they're trying to do the right thing. The problem is very, very few of them, if any. No, that's not true. Very few of them. I've met a whole bunch of, of politicians who actually have technical backgrounds, but we're still talking 5% of the political class around the world. And so most politicians just don't understand the difference between software and uh, source code and binaries. So when they buy voting machines in the United States, and they buy voting machines that are closed. You know, it's binary only software and you don't get a license to look at the software. And now you're trusting the health of your democracy to a machine that is closed source software. You don't actually know what that machine does. It's it just bad for our democracy to not have transparency in the technology we are using. And our politicians don't yet understand this. Um, I'm optimistic that our, our politicians will understand it. The kind of work that Larry Lessig did both at the Creative Commons and now he's doing on the uh, campaigning to try and get money out of our political system. What Larry really cares about is transparency and that's what Larry does and articulates as well as anyone. Um, uh, the guys at, at uh, another nonprofit in the US that, uh, that we helped get started, uh, Public Knowledge, are very much on the same theme. Uh, the EFF does, has, does and has done brilliant work in this space. And you guys, each and every one of you as citizens, of wherever you are citizens, but particularly as citizens of the world, you have a voice. And I know it feels like you're a lone voice in the wilderness, but seriously, collectively you are incredibly powerful. And I need you guys all to step up and make sure that whenever you happen to bump into a politician in, uh, in the street, you make sure that he's aware of what you care about. Because, because you can be as cynical as you like about our political systems, you know, and, and you reassure yourselves with Winston Churchill's great line about democracy is a really terrible way to govern ourselves until we, you consider all the others. Okay. Uh, it may be a, a, a messy system, but having talked to a lot of politicians, the one thing that does reassure you is they're all motivated more by votes than by money. So Larry has a valid point. Money does corrupt our political system, but these guys actually care about votes even more than money because they know that the money flows from the votes, not the other way around. Anyway, so for what it's worth, keep keep doing your bit and collectively we will make a difference. Sorry, there was a question here. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Um, my name is Donna. I helped publish a book called Free Software for Schools using Lulu. I'd love to hear a bit, a story, a Lulu story. Oh, <laughs> Donna, thank you so much. <laughs> Because I am a typewriter salesman, <laughs> and I need an opportunity to make a sale. <laughs> um, uh, the, the real story I'm going to tell you, though, here is, is, you know, Chris is worried about me running over my time, but you guys are actually stuck here for the next two days. <laughs> Because on the, the compensation method that, that we use here, Chris doesn't pay me a nickel to fly all the way to New Zealand to talk to you guys. 
So the only way I get to recover the cost of my time is through impressions. <laughs> so, so the longer I stand here, the more impressions per person I achieve. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm not going to give you much of a pitch on Lulu other than saying uh, uh, it's a fun project. We, we have built this publishing platform that allows you, when you send your book into a publisher and you get a rejection slip, which the publishing industry will tell you they reject 19 out of 20 books that come their way, and they'll tell you that they're doing the world a favor when they do that because they're getting rid of the 19 bad books in favor of the one good book. But the publishing industry's flaw is that uh, they actually get rid of books for three reasons. Uh, one is because the book isn't any good. <laughs> and I'm sympathetic to their point because a lot of those people then come to Lulu and I read a lot of Lulu books and some of them are really bad. <laughs> Okay, but the other two reasons the publishing industry rejects a book are economic reasons. They don't believe the market for the book is big enough. So it doesn't matter how valuable the book is that you've written or the content is that you want to publish to some small marketplace. If that marketplace is not big enough, the publishing industry will not return your phone call. Uh, and the other one is if they already have one of those books. So in the United States, there are six Economics 101 textbooks. And the reason for that is there are six textbook publishers in the United States. They have zero incentive to publish a seventh Economics 101 textbook, no matter how much better that textbook might be than one of the existing six. Um, and so by building a, a publishing platform, Lulu has enabled a, a huge number, millions of, of people around the world to publish their content to their audience without having to go through the publishing industry. Uh, I won't get into the long story as a business, and it's an interesting business one, but I, you, know, you can corner me afterwards, about how Red Hat competing with Microsoft could do something that Microsoft simply wasn't able to do because of their business model that delivered a benefit to our customers that made those customers sufficiently loyal to Red Hat that Red Hat is now, what is it, 7,000 people on their way to $2 billion worth of revenue. Uh, and meanwhile, Lulu, uh, Amazon decided that they really liked what we were doing. So now Amazon are doing very similar things. Of course, they don't do it nearly as well as we do it. <laughs> so you think I was picking on the guys at Sousa? You should get me alone and have me talk about Bezos and Amazon. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, So they don't do it nearly as well as we do, but being the world's biggest bookstore, the typical author says, well, I can use Amazon, and I end up being published on Amazon, and that's all I care about. And so Amazon is a serious competitor of ours in a way that Microsoft was never a serious competitor of the open source uh, movement because they couldn't offer our customers the benefit that we could offer. But follow up afterwards, sure. Well, you said you are a businessman and don't care too much about details. And you praise the GPL, but there is a little deep, uh, detail like GPL version 3, um, which I understand the business world doesn't really adopt. Can you tell us something about that? Uh, so. I've had a lot of these debates with really smart people in this space. Um, and, and your point, uh, the, thank you for acknowledging the problem, which is that I'm a tech writer salesman and I channel my mother. And so when it comes to the details, I sort of, uh, you're going to have to corner uh, Eben at, at, uh, or Karen for that matter. Either of them could argue, uh, could explain. Um, uh, the specifics of, of how things fit into the various categories better than I can do it. Um, but I think if I understand correctly, uh, uh, there's a story that, that would be helpful. Uh, and it's why I am so lost in admiration of what Richard Stallman, uh, the, the genius of his idea that goes back to 1984, where he tried to do a free, free software thing. He, he wrote software and he tried to give it away. And he wanted to work collaboratively with other engineers on this, this project he tried to give away. And the problem is that 
uh, the, and you'll have to ask Richard the specifics of the story, but what he recognized is anyone could take his software, make modest changes to it, and copyright the whole thing such that he would have to pay them royalties to use his own software. Because legally, there was no such thing as the public domain. No judge would have ever punished anyone for doing precisely that because there was no legal structure. The judge could not find someone guilty of taking software that Richard was trying to give away for free and doing something with it. Okay, and what Richard's great innovation was, was to say, look, we don't have to go to Washington and get them to come up with laws around the public domain. We'll use precisely the same laws only use them in the reverse fashion. And we will copyright our code in such a way that it has to stay in the public domain. And that's what the genius of the GPL was. And you can like or not like various terms and, and considerations of the GPL. And I'm not suggesting that the GPL is the only appropriate license. I'm just a big fan of it because it's the, the single most effective license. But there are other licenses that are conceivably more useful in other spaces than, than for Red Hat uh, and our commitment to the GPL. But that's really Richard's genius. And, and that's that 1984 insight into copy left, using the existing copyright legislation to create a public domain is what allows all of us to do what we are doing. Without Stoneman and that insight, we'd all still be writing proprietary software licenses uh, on all of our code. Sorry, there was a question over here. How does the philosophy or your admiration for GPL and free software translate to Lulu, where you're actually publishing? Are you, do you encourage your authors to publish things under GPL? Do you use free software within Lulu to, in, as part of your business? Okay, so uh, yeah, as I say, I'm, I'm not an ideologue. It, it's one of the areas that, uh, that uh, Linus and I haven't spent a huge amount of time together, but eh, you know, we've traded enough debates and I followed his, uh, his arguments on the internet. And we share this one philosophy, which is that we really believe in free markets and we, we believe in the free exchange of ideas. And we don't like imposing a set of rules on people just because they're the correct rules. We should have the debate. We should try it. We should, you know, experiment and figure out what the correct rules by what works. Okay. So my interest in the GPL, what I loved about the Red Hat thing and what we're trying to do with Lulu isn't about source code or about given licenses. It is about empowering customers, empowering users to do things they could not otherwise do. That, that's as a businessman, that's always what you're trying to do. If you're a successful business, it's because you do something for your customers that no one else does as well as you do it. If you're a modestly successful businessman, it's because you're doing things for your customers as well as other people do it. And now you know, customers have an even choice. They can have coffee at Starbucks or they can have coffee at Caribou Coffee. And there's, you know, other than marketing, there is no real magic to what the guys at Starbucks are doing. Um, so, you know, that's how I think about this. And this Lulu idea of what we're really building is, is a democratic platform so anyone can publish their books is in the same theme as what we did at Red Hat. It's a very different um, um, market. It's, it's so, uh, you know. Proof will be in the pudding if, if, uh, if, if Lulu goes public and is worth, how much is Red Hat worth these days? Anyways, <laughs> several billion dollars. Uh, then we will have done a good job for our customers with Lulu. If Lulu remains a, a mid-sized company, we'll have done an okay job for Lulu. And if Lulu goes away, clearly someone else did a better job than we did. Other questions? Yes, hello. I so, and how much time do we have, Chris? Uh, Stephen, how much time? Uh, about, five about five minutes. Okay, go yes. ahead. Um, you mentioned Thomas Sterling, and uh, he, these days he leads the, something called the Center of Research from Extreme Scale Technologies towards Exascale Computing, which leads me to certain analogies that I want to ask the entrepreneur, the business person, if we are in a situation as we were in the 90s. 
is there this new architecture, this new hardware, which all requires a new software paradigm that we can take advantage? Is this a business opportunity out there, or is it just for Department of Defense taking advantage, or major projects, government funded, taking advantage of the excess scale computing which is coming? Okay, and sorry, say that one more time for me. Um, where are you from, by the way? Uh, from different places. I'm from Wamaru in the South Island of New Zealand. But your accent is from where? It's a mix of Uruguay, Hungary, and New Zealand. Oh, oh. There, no wonder I do. <laughs> I'm surprised that you don't recognize it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I was, by the way, I was, I was at a wedding. A cousin's uh, son got married in Adelaide on the weekend. <laughs> You know, very nice, in fact, a wonderful wedding and, and great speakers. And I went up to the speakers afterwards to congratulate them on giving lovely talks at, at, at the wedding. And the only, my only complaint was they spoke in Australian. <laughs> I didn't get a single one of the jokes. <laughs> anyway, sorry, so it, it's... Exascale computing. A lot of uh, floating points or whatever. Oh, okay. what, what, what I heard in your story, and feel free to answer following yeah. your mother's inspiration. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I, ju I just want to say, I, I have uh, Tom Sterling speaking in a conference in one month. Really? About when you see him, you have to go up and thank him for me. I will do okay. that for you. I have not seen uh, Dr. Sterling in... Oh, well, you come back to Wellington in one month, and Wh then you where can is say the for you. Um, it's Wait. in Wellington. Uh, sorry for the ad. Oh, okay. <laughs> Wellington, okay. 17, okay. 18 February. Okay. So the point is, um, he's working on the Extreme Scale Research Center or something like that, yeah. University of Indiana, yeah. towards exascale computing, which is an area that I am exposed due to a big project called the Square Kilometer Array. Yeah. What I'm asking to the entrepreneur who every morning wakes up looking for new business opportunities yeah, yeah. is that. Is this just in the realm of government-funded projects or uh, esoteric thinking, or actually we have a business paradigm? We, uh, yesterday, Eben Moglin said that the new hardware architectures are opening yep. a new world that we yep. don't know yet. Okay, so I'm not going to answer the specific question because I just don't know enough about it. Uh, but <laughs> talking about this wedding as in Adelaide, um, my Aunt Joan, so my cousin, uh, uh, the, his mother is, is Aunt Joan. Aunt Joan is 93 and in very good health. Um, uh, but her memory is suffering, so she's in a home in, in Adelaide. And so I went to visit her, and she, was, she has been a watercolor artist all her life, and she, was, she had a stack of watercolor paintings that she had done. And I mentioned to Janie, my other cousin, uh, you know, say, hey, Janie, so does Aunt Joan sell these? Cheney bursts out laughing, saying, Bob, you are so damn consistent. <laughs> so here I'm visiting my, my Aunt Joan, in, who's a shut-in in Adelaide, and my thought goes to helping Aunt Joan build a business <laughs> around her hobby. Um, okay, so the answer is, uh, here's how to tell. Uh, is if there's enough people like you going to this conference because you need uh, the tools that Sterling and others are working on building, then yes, there's a real business opportunity. Um, but then you have to investigate, is that a business opportunity that is better served by IBM or, or Hewlett Packard or Red Hat than served by some entrepreneur? And the typical difference there is, is it aligned with what one of those big companies already do, simply an extension of what they're doing? Or does it somehow run counter to what they do? And is, in other words, they would have difficulty doing it. And if, if the second, then it's an entrepreneurial business opportunity. If the first, then you know, call up your buddies at Red Hat and say, hey, you should come and do this because I, as a customer, need this service. I can't trust some government agency to support my use of this technology. I want you guys to support the use. But if you say, if these guys all say, oh no, that runs counter to our business model, uh, not a chance are we ever going to do that for you, then you get to either start the business yourself or, or go and find someone who is willing to at least attempt to build a business to support your use of that technology or, or of that solution. Anyways, for what it's worth. Are we done? I think we're all done. Thank you all for joining us. I want you to thank Bob thank for joining you. us.